Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Rougarou Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Molina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Cosmo. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 322 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, as ever, by former heavyweight world title challenger, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, how you doing, my man? I'm good, my man. How about you? Always good when speaking with you, Eddie. That is the truth. Getting on to the review part of the show. We're going to fly through this here. Um, we're going to start at the National Sports Centre in Crystal Palace, London, United Kingdom. This one was on Channel 5. Topping the bill, Isaac Chamberlain now 14-1. and A KO in the very first round against Dylan Prazovic, former world title challenger. He lost in his last fight in the third round. A, a, a knockout loss to, um, to Lawrence Ciccoli. Obviously, both guys have that sole loss to Lawrence Ciccoli. I said on last week's show, I don't think Chamberlain's going to get him out of there quicker than three rounds. He does it in one round. Very impressive. Um, it was a left hook to the body. It was for the vacant IBF International Cruiserweight title. Um, very, very pleased for Chamberlain. Friend of the show, a guy who hasn't been on for quite a while now, but really pleased for him. Nice guy. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure where he goes from here. I think, you know, signing with Mick Hennessy, I, I really like Mick Hennessy, by the way, but I think signing with him, it's not really worked out that good for him. I'm not sure if he had many other offers on the table, to be honest, but after losing to Akoli, it's been so slow his career now. He's boxed a guy here. He's beaten him in better fashion than Akoli. I don't know what, you know, what he does next, but he needs to get moving now, man. He's so... Um, you know he's 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 very talented, but he's he's been so slow. I'm not sure. Like I say, where he goes next, he needs to, you know, be fighting way more regular than he does. Um, anyways, moving on again from there, let's go to the undercard wins for Idris or Idris Virgo now 12 and 0 with a draw, a TKO in round seven against Adam Tronado, who's now six and three. Um, what else? I think the guy was down four times, by the way. Um, Aaron McKenna with a win now, 14-0, and 0, a unanimous decision over eight rounds against Carlos Gallego, who's now 8-2. and two. Aaron McKenna, 14-0. and 0. Um, He came in overweight as well, I believe, Gallego. Anyway, it didn't matter. McKenna won. He's now the new WBC Youth World Middleweight Champion. We've got Casey Benjamin picking up a win, 15-1 and one with a draw. A KO in round two against Wiston Campos. Campos down in the first round and out in the second. He's now 33-9 and nine with... With six draws. Um, Stephen McKenna as well with a win. He's now um, he's now 11-0. and 0, A TKO in the first round against last-minute replacement Jack Eubank, who's now 4-5. Um, he was supposed to be fighting a guy here, Eddie. Um, this, this guy, Stephen McKenna. Supposed to be fighting a guy at 147. He weighed in at 146 and three quarters, and the guy that was supposed to be fighting him weighed in 16 pounds over the limit. Not sure why he bothered turning up in the UK, by the way. And in stepped this this last wow. this last late minute or uh, late late <laughs> God Almighty last minute late replacement opponent who was four and four. Have you ever heard of a guy coming in that much overweight in all your years? <laughs> Honestly, I don't think so. The only thing I can remember is like, I think it was Gotti and Joy Gamash. When, um, when he made the weight though, but he came in and rehydrated at crazy numbers. Like he was like 147 when they were fighting at like 135. That's as close as I've ever heard. It was, it might have been, no, I think he actually rehydrated to more, more like 150 something, like almost 160, which was crazy, but man. And moving out now to the Melbourne Pavilion in Victoria, Australia. That's my Australian accent, or as good as it gets. I'm not too good at it. I don't know. Um, I don't want to offend anyone, so I'm probably going to switch it back. 
Um, I'm not sure why we came over here. Oh, yeah, it was for this guy. Sam Solomon, former world champion, now 47-16 and 16 with a draw. He beat Jesse White, who is now 6-2. and two. Horrendous mismatch on paper, but he beat him on a split decision after six rounds. Not sure what he's still doing knocking about Sam Solomon. Um, moving out now to Japan at the International Conference Hall. Over here we had Kosi Tanaka with a win. 16-1 and one now, a split decision over 10 rounds against Shoashida, now 29-3. and three. Um, A bit surprising, that one, to be honest with you. I think Tanaka was a big favourite. Didn't watch it. I'm going to hold my hands up. Moving out now to Kazakhstan at the CSKA Sport Complex over here. Stephen Ward lost um, a technical decision in round 7. I think he was badly cut. He went to the cards. He lost every round to Kash uh, Kamshibek Kung. Kabaev, who's now 4 and 0, um Stephen Ward 13 and 2. That one was for the vacant WBA Gold World Cruiserweight title. Um nothing else really on that card. Moving out now to Russia. I didn't see this either, mind you, but I've been told it's not worth watching back. It was a really boring fight. Dmitry Bivol defended successfully his WBA World Light Heavyweight title against Umar Salamov. Salamov now 26 and 2. Bivol with another points win now 19 and 0. Um on the undercard as well, Shavkat Zonrakimov with a win. 16 wins he's got there, so a 16th win for him. Um, he's got the one draw. His opponent retired on his store at the end of round two. His opponent's now four and five. Again, I think that was a, a late addition, a late replacement there, his opponent. Um, nothing else on the undercard. There was a lot of fights fall through, actually, on fight week of last week. Um, a lot of fights fell through, including, obviously, Casemiro, Butler, and... Various other fights as well. I can't remember right now, but there's a lot of fights that fell through. Um, moving out now to the Coca-Cola Arena in Dubai, United Arab Emirates over here. We had on the undercard wins for John O'Carroll, friend of the show, now 21-2 and two with a draw. A KO in round two against Aelio Mesquita, who's now 26-1. Um... Donny Nietes as well. He is now 43, 1 and 6 draws he has. A split draw over 10 rounds against Norberto Jimenez, who's now um, 39 and 6. 30 wins, 9 losses, 6 draws. So both guys had 5 draws each. Now they've got 6 draws each there for the WBO International Super Flyweight title. Like I said, a split draw. Very close fight. Um, and the main event, Sonny Edwards with a win. He's now 17-0. and 0, A successful defense there of his of his IBF World Flyweight title against Filipino Jason Mama, who's now 16-1. and 1. Um, Typical performance, really, from, from Sonny Edwards, you know. Um, a rough, you know, a rough start to the fight, I think. He got roughed up a little bit early on by Mama. Uh, a few dirty tricks and stuff like that he was pulling, but then he got into his groove. And once Sonny Edwards is in that groove, he is effortlessly sublime. I've got to say it. I think there's no beating him when he's at his best. And he was brilliant when he got into that groove. So as predicted, he cruised to a wide points win. Um... Yeah, moving out now to the Echo Arena, Liverpool, over here um, on, on the zone. This one was on the undercard. Let's talk about it. Jordan Gill, now 26-1 and one with a draw. It, 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 went as a, it went down as a technical draw. He took on Alan Castillo, who was 27-11. and 11. Um, He was cut on his hairline, Jordan Gill, and the fight ended up getting stopped. A technical draw in round three of an eight-rounder there. Um, we had... Kalmin Agyarko, I think I may be saying his name wrong, but he's now 10-0, a ninth round knockout against Noe Larios Jr., who was undefeated 14-0. Um, yeah, I expected that to go points, but good for Agyarko there. That one was for the vacant WBA international middleweight title. Good prospect is Agyarko. Elsewhere on the card, talking of good prospects, Joe Cordina now 14-0, a unanimous decision over 10 rounds against Miko Kachatarian, who... Was also 13 and 0, now 13 and 1. That one there for Cordina's WBA Continental Super Featherweight title. Um, Robbie Davies Jr. with a knockout in the second round against Hank Lundy. Hank Lundy has decided to retire from the sport following this defeat. Here he's now 31 and 10 with a draw. Knocked out in the second round, failed to make the weight as well. Came in um, not much over, but just over, I think by a quarter of a pound. 
Um, it was for the vacant WBA Continental Super Lightweight title. I've got to say, I think he's 37 now, Hank Lundy. Um, I just did not expect that to happen, considering that he'd gone the distance with Jose Zapida about, what was it, seven months ago? He hadn't had a fight in between then and now. And he gets knocked out in two rounds by Robbie Davies, who I felt, by the way, would possibly lose to Hank Lundy. I, I had a sneaky suspicion that Hank Lundy could pull it off. Um, but yeah, he looked absolutely shot to pieces, um, um, Hank Lundy. And it's a huge statement on paper, that, for Robbie Davies Jr., you know. I felt that that fight had points written all over it. And if there would be a knockout, I think I would have probably felt that Lundy would get the knockout. But both guys not really known as big punchers, especially at 140, by the way, for both guys. So that's quite impressive there from Robbie Davies. Um, elsewhere on the card, I didn't see much of it, but Katie Taylor now 20-0, and a unanimous decision over 10 two-minute rounds against Firuza Sharapova, who's now 14-2. and A defense there of Taylor's WBC, WBA, WBO, and IBF world female lightweight titles. Um... What else do we have? Um, I think that's it. Go straight to the main event now. Conor Ben 20-0, and 0, a KO in round four against Chris Algieri, who's now 25-4. Uh, and 4. That one for Conor Ben's WBA Continental Welterweight title. Down twice in the second round, Algieri. Uh, sorry, once in the second round, Algieri, and then KO'd. Um, brutally in the end in round four. I want to come to you straight away, Eddie. Did you happen to see um, that 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 brutal knockout from Conor Ben? No, I did not. I did oh. not. I, 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 it was bad, huh? I, oh. I got to watch. I got to see. Yeah, very, very, um, you know, unexpected, I felt. I felt certainly it would go late, if not go points. Um, you know, Ben was in total control. I gave him the first round. Obviously, he got a knockdown in the second round, which I felt was a was a tangle of legs. Really, I didn't think it should have been a knockdown. Round three, right. I was very impressed with with Conor Ben's head movement um, and his improvement. Really, just just all round from what he was to what he right. is now. If you'd have said three years ago his head movement's really good, people would have probably laughed. But now. You know, he's, he's really come on leaps and bounds. And it was a brutal KO, a huge one-two combination. And he knocks him out quicker than the one guy that knocked him out previously, which was, of course, Errol Spence. So, big statement there for Conor Ben, who got Algieri out in round four. Um, that's it for the UK. Moving out now to the, to, to the States once again. We're going to go here to Carson, California at the Dignity Health Sports Park. Over here on the undercard, um, another win for Andrew Tabiti. He returned to the ring. He's now 18 and won a KO in round five against Mitch Williams, who's now 16, 9 and 3. Elsewhere on that card, Brandon Lee with another knockout win. A seventh round KO against Juan Heraldez, now 16, 2 and 1. Brandon Lee, 24-0, I think, with 22 KOs. Um, really good win for him there. Um, Quadratilo Abdukukarov, who had a record of 18-0. He got in there with Cody Crowley, who was 19-0. But Abdukukarov was a huge favorite in that fight. Crowley was down in the second round. Um, Abdukukarov got cut in round five, and it ended in a, in a unanimous decision for Cody Crowley, who seemed to have much more heart and much more determination and drive and will and all the rest of it. Not so much... I don't think his skills paid the bills, but what a brilliant win for him. And, you know, he puts himself, I think, now in, in the top end of the world rankings there at 147. I think Abdukukarov was was coming up to be called the mandatory for Errol Spence. Oh, boy, oh, boy, what a time to lose. And topping that bill, um, Nonito Donaire, friend of the show, now 42-6. and six, A knockout in round four against Raymark Gabayo, 24-0. Now 24-1, and one, a fourth round KO there for Donaire's WBC Bantamweight World title. The left hook comes through once again for Nonito Donaire, who I think is, is tied at age 39 as being the oldest world champion out of all the reigning world champions. I think it's him and someone else who I cannot remember who it is, but anyways, they're both 39. Um... In the press conference, Raymark Gabayo, when asked a question in English, he was struggling with, with how to answer it in English. He was struggling. He didn't know which word he was going to use. He was, he's getting a bit confused. And would you believe it? The classy Nonito Donaire at the press conference said, what are you trying to say? And the guy said, I don't know. 
I'm trying to, you know, and he said, say it in Filipino to me. So actually, Donaire translated the words of Gabayo, his opponent, um, which was really cool. He got a round of applause for that. And, you know, he's full of class, Donaire. I love Donaire, man. He is one of my favorite fighters. He really is. Absolutely love Nonito Donaire. And really pleased to see him win that fight. I thought he'd win all day long. Um, Gabayo did okay though in those in those in those rounds until that punch and like I say Nonito Donaire with that left hook it's honestly one of the most uh, devastating weapons in in boxing really and it has been for for a number of years now. And moving now to uh, this one here, it took place in, uh, in in Madison Square Garden, New York, USA. Over here on the undercard, we had. Miko Ali Walsh with a win now 3 and 0 a majority decision over four rounds against Reyes Sanchez who's now 6 and 1 um 3 and 0 Miko Ali Walsh two guys have been undefeated and the other guy had a winning record so everyone he's faced so far in the pro ranks has been uh, has had a had a winning record two of them have been undefeated um so yeah good stuff for him I think he lost the third round quite clearly but I don't think he lost the fight I think he won it 3-1 that was pretty much how a lot of people had it there was one card that was a draw one card that gave him every round I don't know how you could do that at all um but yeah you know he's still learning on the job Keyshawn Davis with a win as well 4-0 now a TKO in round two against Jose Zaragoza who's now 8-4 with a draw um what else do we have Young Xander Zayez now 12-0, a KO in the first round against Alessio Mastronunzio, who's now 9-2. Jared Anderson, the real big baby, now 11-0, friend of the show with a TKO in round two against the Ukrainian fighter based in Canada, um, Alexander Teslenko, now 17-2. But let's just focus on the main event. Vasily Lomachenko, now 16-2, and two, a unanimous decision over 12 rounds against Richard Comey there for the vacant WBO Intercontinental Lightweight title. Comey down in round 7. Vasily Lomachenko signaled to the corner that they should probably stop the fight. At that point, it did not look like Comey would go the, the distance in the end. I wanted him to go the distance. You know, he's a nice guy, Comey. I actually would have liked to see him win the fight. He's been on the show, therefore he's a friend of the show, therefore I support him in every fight. But, um... You know, very, very nice guy, very proud guy, and it was good to not see him get knocked out, to be honest with you. Um, but yeah, Lomachenko was pretty much in full control from the start to the finish. Um, what can I say? What what more can I say about it, really? I mean, he did what he wanted to do in there with him, um, and, you know, he was sensational once again. Some people are saying, Eddie, that this looks like Lomachenko from three years ago. What did you make of it? I know you saw it. Very dominating performance once again from Mr. High Tech, um, a.k.a. What do they call him? Um, the Matrix. <laughs> I was once again thoroughly impressed um, with what he's able to do. It's just his, his, his boxing IQ is off the charts. I think has one of the best IQs in in boxing, um, and that's barring any any other other weight, uh, and then his understanding of you know how to defend, like I, he does some of the things that I've even done before and that I do, and I felt like I had to do, and it's like certain times when you slip shots, putting like a shield up just in case, you know the guy gets a shot that possibly can land. I've seen him do a, you know, a couple different times in that fight and in other fights. Um, footwork again once again you know it was all over the place man it's hard it's hard to figure out where he's coming from you know what i mean and then you're thinking you're you're gonna hit him and you're hitting the fresh air you know what i'm saying and and then like you've got a you got a good shot at him you think you got a good shot like i seen Kobe, you know like really honing in on a couple of the shots he was trying to throw like sitting down on him thinking he had a had a good a good look at him and turn around all of a sudden he's behind you kind of shit it's just <laughs> I look at I look at Lomachenko as probably one of the most frustrating fighters to fight, possibly ever. You know what I mean? Because he's just all he's, he's he's always coming on angles. He's always defensively conscious. He's always making sure he he follows certain rules. And um, you know, and then, and then he's smart enough to know that touching you, putting it, putting it, putting his hands on you, can sometimes fool you into just you know, getting a little relaxed, not thinking anything's going to come hard in that particular moment, and then boom, a big shot comes right after. 
You know what I mean? Really, really educated boxer. Man. He, he knows, you could tell he studied this basically his whole life. And, and uh, he's one of the best at it for that reason. And it's just, you know, I could go on all day about saying what he does well. But you know, like I said, I think it's his IQ that really sets, it was IQ and his footwork that really sets him apart. I mean, his punch selection we know is good, but I think that's all based off of the position he puts himself in, you know, from his footwork. And, um, you know, he's pretty, he's, he's definitely, a, you know, he's, he's, he's got the hand speed, obviously. But like I said, I pay attention to what he's doing and how he sets it up. Never looks out of position, never looks uncomfortable, always looks in position to do it. He always looks ready to do what is necessary to win. And, uh, you know, A plus as far as I, as far as I would grade it. Excellent performance. Yeah, it truly was. It really was. Always great to see him fight him. And hopefully he has a huge year in 2022 with those other lightweights. There's, there's a list of them. Um, moving out now to the 2300 Arena in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Over here, Jesse Hart with a win. A TKO in round three against David Murray. Jesse Hart now 28-3. and three, Friend of the show. Really pleased for him. And moving out now to a card that took place earlier this week. Tuesday, the 14th of December in Japan at the, Ko- at the Kokugikan... I'm not sure where it is, but anyways, it's in it's somewhere in Tokyo. Um, Naoya Inoue with a win. Um, he is now 22 and 0. He was able to knock out his opponent Aran Bipian, who's now 12 and 3. Um, he'd never been stopped in his two losses. He's been stopped there. That one for Inoue's WBA and IBF World Bantamweight titles. But that is it, though, for the review part of the show. Just before we welcome our first guest, it's now time to thank our sponsor this podcast is sponsored by manscaped but the opinions expressed are those of myself and former heavyweight world title challenger eddie chambers this is the season to be jolly not to be hairy this is the time of year that your sack should have presents inside not wild hairs on the outside and this is your last chance to grab someone that perfect gift before christmas is here visit manscaped.com and remember to use the promo code box hard for 20 percent off plus free shipping i personally recommend the performance package 4.0 which again contains the lawnmower 4.0 bush trimmer the weed whacker nose and ear hair trimmer the crop preserver anti-chafing ball deodorant the crop reviver which is a ball spray toner it's like a little spritz to make everything smell even better and of course the magic mat for catching all the trimmings you'll also receive two free gifts the shared travel bag and the manscaped branded anti-chafing boxer shorts all of this is what you'll receive if you order the performance package 4.0 i own one eddie owns one this is good stuff your balls will thank you and so will anyone that goes near your balls for that matter this will leave you feeling comfortable and confident and ready to take whatever the day throws at you i also want to specifically recommend the manscaped cologne by the way which smells terrific and matches the fragrance of all their other products once again this could be an excellent gift idea for anyone you can gift it to yourself your family your friends your partner anyone literally anyone will be pleased with this as a gift everything i'm speaking about has been tried and tested by myself and eddie and we put our stamp of approval all over this stuff remember to visit the website once again www.manscaped.com and use that promo code box hard for 20 percent off plus free shipping but that brings part one to a close the final thing for me to do is to welcome our special guest on this week's podcast Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the former middleweight world title challenger, Mr. Liam Williams. Liam, welcome back on the show, my man. It's been a while. Hey, mate, those things. Um, yeah, it's been a little while. You know, a um, cu- couple of things going on. Um, obviously, some some big changes to camp and whatnot. So, um, but yeah, we're on the right track. Everything's going great, mate. Thanks. Excellent to hear, my man. So, yeah, we last spoke... Um, yeah, quite a while ago, back in March of 2020, right as the pandemic was starting to warm up. Uh, since then, obviously, you've had the two fights, Andrew Robinson and, and Andrade. Before I get onto this upcoming fight, just give me a couple words, if you can, Liam, on your assessment now, looking back at the Andrade fight. Bit of a nightmare start, but a very strong finish. Probably frustrating looking back now a bit. Yes, you know, uh, first and foremost, it was like, 
we didn't get the, the start we wanted. Obviously, got dropped early. Um, just got, got off to a really crappy start, but um, you know it is what it is. That boxing, um, it was it, it was a frustrating night for me, if I'm being honest. Um, he he was very good. I knew he was very good anyway, but he, even better, even more so than what I thought, to be honest. Um, he's very tricky, obviously being a, a rangy southpaw with with a high skill set. Um, but he could actually punch a little bit as well, which I was quite surprised by. Um, don't get me wrong, I weren't really too phased. Um, I, I don't get me wrong, I co- got caught with a couple of good shots and I did get hurt a few times. But, you know, the, them shots I got it with with big shots and they were knock most people out. So, um, you know, I, I showed my grit. I come through um, and I pushed him towards the end of the fight. Um I made a good account to myself, which is the main thing. Obviously, we would have rather come away with the win than the loss. But, um, you know, shit happens. That's, that's boxing. Um, you know, you have you have good days and you have bad days at the office. And, and that obviously wasn't my, my best, for sure. Yeah, no, I think, obviously, after the start you had, I think you finished very well, actually, and had him in trouble. You didn't even mention that, but I felt you had him in a lot of trouble towards the end. Um, Moving on, your next fight's penned in with Chris Eubank Jr. It was obviously pushed back due to an injury on your side. What happened there, Liam? Uh, So, to be honest, going right back, um, even going into the Andrade fight, I was was injured then um, for, like, probably six weeks before the Andrade fight it was I had this pain in my shoulder um, and and it did I'm not making excuses I'm not saying I would the fight would have been different who knows but with um, with the Andrade fight even in the camp during the build up and when I was sparring and stuff sometimes it would take me two three rounds to get going um, because when I was trying to flick the jab and I, I was getting this I was getting this grinding and, and a very painful achy feeling in my left shoulder um, obviously that didn't help me in the Andrade fight either but anyway moving forward to your question um, I had an operation shortly after the fight um, I had an op- operation about four weeks I believe. let's just say about a month after the Andrade fight and um, everything was fairly good if I'm being honest I probably put it under a little bit too, pre- too much pressure too soon Um <laughs> and and that obviously resulted in me picking up a, a bit of a niggle again, which was nothing to to worry about, you know, in terms of moving forward. But I couldn't um, I couldn't move forward with my with my intense training um, right away. You know, I needed to give myself a couple of weeks, which I've obviously gave myself now, um, and, and I'm back to back up to full speed pretty much. And obviously the new date, January 29th in Cardiff. Um, it's a brilliant fight, Liam. It really is. How do you see it playing out with your style up against Eubanks? I mean, I can only see fireworks here. Yeah, mate. Um, to be honest with you, I think, I do think there's going to come a point in the fight where it's just going to be, it's going to be an all-out war and it's kind of going to be um, survival of the fittest sort of tactics. Um, you know, we're going to, Start trading heavy blows, and it's kind of whoever got most in the tank and who wants them more. <laughs> but um, but I do think I do think it's, it's got potential to be a bit the KG for the first rounds because we it's obviously a, a highly anticipated fight. People are excited and saying it's going to be um, fireworks and whatnot. So I think probably it's probably going to be a bit cautious from from both parties to be honest with you. Um, you know, I I could sit here and say I'm probably I'm just going to go in and and bang him out and whatnot. But I honestly think um, the, the fight is going it's not going to be an easy fight. I need to to play my cards right and, and how I go about things. So um, I do think probably a KG couple of opening rounds and feeling each other out, and then I think there's going to come a certain point in the fight where something just clicks and it's just going to be like right here we go. Um, and it's, it's gonna, I'm gonna light them up basically. <laughs> 
Um, to fight back in Cardiff as well for the first time in almost four years. Um, you know, what does that mean to you to bring as well a big name like Eubank over there for your more local fan base? I know that there there was a big um, kind of homecoming for you when you came back from the States as well. Yeah, of course, mate. Um, <clears throat> with the with the homecoming, um, you know, when I come on whatnot, although, although I didn't get the win, um, you know, for me to come on to that kind of reception, that was... That meant just as much to me. It was amazing. You know, I've got unbelievable support from from the valleys in Wales, and um, it's it's quite it's quite touching, really, to be honest with you. The the amount of people that um, that do show me love and support, and um, from from where I live, and you know, to many people, I am truly looked up to. You know, so that's an unbelievable feeling. It's it's amazing. Recently, very recently, you've parted ways with Dom Ingle. You're now training under Adam Booth. Um, why Adam Booth? And, you know, what exactly happened, if you can speak about that? Is everything amicable and stuff? <coughs> yeah, mate. Um, so to start with, um, in terms of me leaving the Ingle gym and leaving Dom, that's, you know, we, we haven't fallen out. Um, we still remain friends. Um, it, it's just one of them things where, um, I started to become stale. Um, I kind of had enough of being there in Sheffield. Um, wasn't I wasn't feeling that good vibe anymore. Um, in in fact, if I'm being honest, with you, I was I was sick of boxing. So it's funny how things work. Um, everything happened for a reason. I'm, I do believe in that. Um, you know, obviously, I picked up that injury. I was I was going. I was, what was it, three weeks, maybe three and a half weeks from the fight when it happened. <clears throat> and um, it's, it's almost like a blessing in disguise because thinking back now, I wasn't, I wasn't any men- in, the, in the best mental state going into that fight. I, was, I really wasn't enjoying it and I wasn't enjoying boxing overall. I kind of got sick of it, um, which obviously I had that injury and, I thought, shit, this is this is my opportunity. I need to make moves, and and I need to need to make them fast, you know. So, um, obviously, um, Adam Booth is probably, uh, well, now I've started to work with him. I would say he's, he's the best coach in Britain, and if not, he's he's one of the best coaches worldwide. He's very um, in depth about everything he does. Um, he, there's a reason behind it, every single thing he has me doing. Um, yeah, it's just it's fantastic to be honest with you, and I, and I don't want to sound disrespectful to anybody at um, at the Ingle Gym and, and to Dom. Um, it's it's an interesting change. Obviously, I remember Adam Booth had a tiny little frame where he was working with Eubank, and it didn't work out between them. So it is interesting. Um, your former opponent, Alontez Fox, is boxing this weekend for the WBA Super Middleweight World Title or a version of it against David Morrell. Um, would you like to send him a message at all of good luck being a former opponent of yours? All the best to Atlantis Fox. Um, he he seems a nice guy, you know. I know he had a little bit of back and forth, full fight, but that kind of standard with myself. As you probably know, I'm, I'm one of them people who, um, you know, I like to get the juices flowing. And I like to get that bit of needle. Um, but all the best to Atlantis Fox. I, I genuinely wish him all the best, and, and I hope... Um, I hope he goes and smashes yeah. and he wins that fight. And of course, your now former gym mate, Bradley Skeet, quite clearly hard done by the other week. The British board held a meeting and decided to okay. rule in favour of referee Steve Gray. What do you make of this madness, Liam? I know you're real annoyed about this. Yeah, mate, I've, I've, I was a bit upset about this, to be honest with you. You've probably seen, um, I don't know, I've seen it in my Twitter post or something. Um, I was kind of... Uh, I, I, I acted on my emotions, if I'm being honest with you. I was really, really pissed off because, um, because you know, Brad, like, Brad's a very good friend of mine. I'm, um, I've got so much respect for him. I've, I've known for Brad for a long time, even before he came to the Ingle Gym. Um, as I said, we're very good friends, and I, I thought he was breezing that fight. He was, he was boxing so well. Um, and the most disappointing part is everybody wrote him off. Everybody said he was going to get knocked out. He was going to get you know, schooled by the younger man, he's going to get beat up. And he, and he performed unbelievably well. And, and um, can I just add, like, 
I'm, I'm so proud of Adam. Um, I, I think the world of him. Um, it, it was just very disappointing, you know, for, for a man to get hit three times while being on the floor. He, he got hit three times, but the first one was a bit of a touch. And then bang, bang, right, left hooks when he had a knee on the floor. Um, yeah, man, it really, really pissed me off. It was, it was um, you know, he had that fight one. He just had to, he just had to get through two more rounds and, you know, stick to what he was doing the whole fight. And and he was, a, he was the winner, and he could have moved on. But instead, you know, it was a very shitty decision made by the referee. You know, nothing, nothing personal towards Steve Gray. Um, a referee has to make a a choice there and then and he has to act very quickly and you know um, he, I, I do believe he should have held his hands up and, and said you know I made the wrong decision but um, in respect of him you, you do have to make a very quick decision and, and sometimes sometimes you get it wrong and he did get it wrong that night so hopefully Brad does get that rematch and the, the, the same thing happens next time minus minus the punches whilst being down and he gets the win I want to ask you this as well, obviously, again, yeah. f- former gym mate, the reason I'm asking you this is because some people feel like he doesn't have much left. Uh, Kel Brook against Amir Khan. People are kind of saying who's got the <clears throat> most left of what they've got, but you obviously have, have you know, sparred Kel, seen behind behind closed doors. How do you see that fight playing out, unbiased? <laughs> um, it's, it's hard to be <laughs> unbiased, funny. if I'm being totally honest with you, because, as you can imagine, you know, I've, I've spent all the time with Kel and Again, we we are friends. I've got a lot of respect for him. So, um, but <coughs> listen, Khan, um, he's, he's obviously still got a bit left. He's um, he was where he was, unbelievable fighter, very fast hand, and and um, and, a, and a top quality operator. So, um, but but then on the other other hand, so is Kelly. He's been at he's been at that high level. Both of them have, and um, I just think, from my point of view, I just think. Khan doesn't hold the shot very well, um, and, K- and Kel is the definitely the bigger, stronger, and, and um, harder punching man. So um, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. You know, um, I believe the fight is made at one. Do you know 50, what? You caught it? me on the spot. I'm not even sure. <laughs> or one four nine or something. Or one, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah, it might even be one four nine. You know, but either way. Um, that's my problem. Is is I think the the weight will affect Kel more than it will Khan. So it's an, it's a very interesting fight. I'm I'm definitely um, interested to see how it goes. Obviously, wish Kel all the best. I'll I'm, I'll obviously speak to him anyway. But um, <clears throat> I believe if if Kel turns up then and he can plan to throw on Khan, then I believe it's it's a um, good night for Khan. But you never know. He he um, he, he is a outstanding talent even even though he's not what he once was my last real question for you Liam in the month of December everyone that I interview every year I like to ask what's on your Christmas wish list in terms of your boxing career where can you be uh, this time next year in a realistic world where do you want to be this time next year realistic world um, well mate I I never I never look too mm-hmm. far into the future with boxing Um you know, um, things happen very quickly. Um, you could you could turn into a superstar overnight, and sometimes your career can end overnight. It's, it is what it is. But ideally, for me, um, one fight at a time. I just want to go and batter Eubank and re- really put on a good display, and then and then get a massive fight on the back end of it. Which is um, ideally for me. I, I would um, I've said it for quite a while now. I, I want to fight Golovkin. And uh, if you've got any closing words, just before we wrap it up, Liam, to the listeners, say whatever you like, absolutely whatever you like, before we let you go. Nothing more than just um, happy Christmas to everybody. I hope you all enjoy. Stay safe. Um, all, all the usual stuff, mate. Just hope you have a great time. And think of me when when I'm uh, at home eating salads and training <laughs> twice a day. We fight. certainly will try to think of you around that time, Liam, when we're all stuffing our bellies. <laughs> Yeah, bull, bullshit. <laughs> but listen, Liam, it's been a real pleasure catching up with you again. Best of luck for January 29th, and I look forward to catching up with you sometime after. And once again, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you. Awesome, mate. Thanks. I appreciate your time also. 
Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, normally the news part of the show, but we have nothing at the moment. So if anything develops from now to the end of the show, we will speak about it at the very end on the outro. We're going to start here with the preview part at the Bell Centre in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Over here... Artur Baturbiev, 16-0 and in a 12-rounder, defending his WBC and IBF lightweight, not lightweight, light heavyweight world titles against USA's Marcus Brown, 24-1. and um, I don't know what it is, Eddie, because Brown has been down a few times in his career, um, down off Pascal a few times, I think down off someone else. But I've just got this weird feeling that Marcus Brown's going to do something in this fight, and I, I've i not seen anyone else agree with that, but I just think the natural athleticism of Brown, and just maybe the age as well of Baturbiev, he's going to be 37 next month, I have just got a weird feeling that Brown's got a big chance in this fight, if, however, he doesn't get hit which he can get hit, and he can go down, but you can't afford to get hit properly by this guy because everyone goes down and stays down, 16-0, and 0, 16 KOs. Yeah, I, I I do agree. He is he does have a great deal of athleticism. He's talented. He's got, he's, got, he's got pedigree. He's got ability. He's got a lot of different things to bring to the table. But Baturbiev is probably one of the toughest puzzles to solve in boxing right now, and when I say tough, I mean tough. Hard-headed guy comes forward, uh, very, very hard puncher, very determined, and it just seems like it's only a matter of time when you're in there with him. Eventually, he's going to land the shot he needs to get you out of there. And like you said, 16 no 16 knockouts, everybody has stayed down. So, And I've seen him in there with good, talented boxers, and, you know, it, it's just it's just he's a tough, rugged kind of guy. And he's not a terrible fighter or anything by any means he's not just tough he still knows how to box he knows how to get you you know cornered he knows how to land certain shots he knows he knows what his best shots are you know so it's going to be a very difficult fight for marcus brown i'm not sure that he's going to be able to pull this one off it can happen you know and, and everybody got a bunch of chance even though you know most people think you know feel understand how, how how tough of a chin this guy has too so it's like there's a lot of there's a lot of things that can happen in boxing. There's a lot of ways things can shake out differently. But it's really I don't I agree he's a little older, so things may start to get a little bit more tender, you know, like chin different things. But I just think that his punching power and his his uh, aggressiveness and things like that is going to win the night. I think at the end of the day it's going to be uh, better be able to win, and probably by a stoppage at some point. Um, Anywhere from the, I would say the fifth on, maybe even earlier. Okay, interesting take. I mean, we shall see. I just got this feeling, especially if it goes late. I've got a feeling that Brown can outbox um, Baturbia, but we will see. Again, I I sometimes say crazy things. Sometimes it makes me look really stupid. Sometimes I look like a genius. I'm going to just gamble (laughs) here with that one. Um, Moving out now to Tashkent in Uzbekistan. This one's going to be on the zone again Friday. Um, Over here we've got Israel Madrimov, 7-0 in a 12-rounder against France's Michel Soro, who is 35-2 with a draw. We've also got Bektemir Melikuziev, 7-1, coming off that crushing knockout to Gabriel Rosado, one of the best knockouts of 2021. That's an 8-rounder there. He gets it's in with Sergey Ekimov, who's 18 and 3. Um, what else do we have? We've got um, Shakram Giasov as well, 11 and 0. He gets in with Christian Coria, who's 29 and 8 with two draws. Moving out now to Kazakhstan over here, we've got Daniel Yelusinov, the Olympic gold medalist, 10 and 0 in a 12 rounder against Juan Liao, who is 15 and 1. That one there for the vacant IBO welterweight world title. We've got Ivan Daiko as well, 10 and 0, 10 KOs, the heavyweight um, who's been in there with a who's who of guys in the amateurs and is not wasting any time really as a as as a pro. Um, just a little recap: he's beaten in in the amateurs the likes of Eric Pfeiffer, the likes of um, Effie Jagba. He beat um, Majidov. He beat Filip Hergovic. Beat Zili Zhang. Um, He's been in there. He's beaten Jalalov, who we saw fight on the weekend. He's been in there with with Tony Yoka. He's been in there with um, many, many guys. Been in there with Joe Joyce. 
been in there with Anthony Joshua. The guy is a really, really good uh, deep pedigree fighter. He gets in with Alexander Ustinov, 36 and 5 with a draw. Uh, that's over 10 rounds there. Also on the card, nothing else really to mention on that one. Moving out now to Mexico, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. gets out again. I hope it's not going to be as embarrassing as his as his fight with Anderson Silva, but he's 52 and 6 with a draw in a 10 rounder against David Zegara, who's 34 and 6. Um Moving out now to the Manchester Arena over here on the undercard, we've got Alan the Savage Babich. Haven't seen an opponent for him just yet. He's 9 0, no opponent for him. Uh, we've also got on the card Jordan Thompson, 11 0. I think coming off that first round knockout last time out, he's in a six rounder against Clement Openo, who's 5 1. We've got Zelfa Barrett, 26 1, getting in with Bruno Torimo, who's 26 2 2. We've got Jack Cullen. Um, Little Leavers Meet Cleaver, the nickname 20 and 2 with a draw, fighting for the vacant EBU European super middleweight title against late replacement Kevin Sadjo, who's 16 and 0. Um, we've got Carlos Gongora, 20 and 0 in a 12 rounder against our very own Lerone Richards, 15 and 0 there for the IBO world super middleweight title. But let's go straight to the main event. I'm going to come to you straight away here, Eddie. Joseph Parker, 29 and 2, a rematch I don't think he really needed with Derek Delboy Chisora, 32 and 11. Um, it's going to be interesting, just like the first fight was. The first fight was very close. I couldn't believe it when Chisora put Parker down within about 20 seconds of the first round. I've just got a feeling, though. I I've always said it. I think these two having 100 fights, I think it goes the distance 100 times. I think Parker points like I did the first fight. I was right the first time. I think it's going to be the same, but probably not as close this time around. Yeah, I agree with that. I think now he understands a little bit more what, he what he's dealing with. He's not going to take in, you know, oh, he's he's a little older. He's He's been beat by this guy and beat by that guy because Chisora, Chisora comes to fight everybody no matter who he fights. So he's going to put, he's going to, uh, you know, he's going to put them hands up and come out swinging. <laughs> Joe Frazier style, that's the way he is. Um, but I think Joseph Parker's, gonna, you know, he understands it more. He, he knows what to expect. Um, he's going to box probably a lot better. He's going to He's going to stand when he needs to. I think, and, and, and not completely just can continue to move, go in reverse because that's a bad thing too, especially when you got an aggressive guy coming. It just continues to give him confidence. So um, I think he's going to do the right thing. I keep the jab in his face. I want to do a couple a couple other little things to to just keep the fight just where he needs it, not to allow Shazor to get too aggressive, too, too much confidence and, and stick around too long on the inside. So, yeah. I can agree with that, Joe. I think it's going to be pretty, pretty much. Uh, uh, it's going to be interesting because Chisora's going to make it interesting. He's going to come to fight, but I think uh, Joseph Parker's younger. He's he's fresher. He's got a, lot, a little bit, you know, he's a better you know, better boxer, especially at this this stage in his career. Um, at any stage, really, because that's not Chisora's style. But um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. I was a fight that I would want to see, regardless of them having the first one, because like I said, Chisora's going to bring it, but. I'm going to go with uh, Joe Parker, too. All the best to Joseph Parker, friend of the show. Really, really cool guy. Moving out now to the Rainton Meadows Arena over here in Tynum, where um, on this card here, I'm not sure if it, I think it might be a boxer card. It might be on Box Nation as well, so watch out for that. Um, on the card, we've got Joe Laws, 11-1. and one, No opponent just yet for him. Um... We've got Thomas Patrick Ward, 30-0 with a draw. He gets in with Leonardo Padilla, who is 20-3 from Venezuela. Um, I've said it before about Thomas Patrick Ward. He has an incredibly padded record. He was a great amateur. He's been a great pro, still unbeaten and all the rest of it. Cannot seem to get a big fight. I don't know what the hell is going on with him, but I will say... Um, he hasn't looked good lately, and I've said it. I hope I'm wrong, because at one point, he was one of our best prospects in the UK, but it seems like he's burned out a little bit now. Um, you know, he had that, that draw with Thomas Asomba. That was a really, really tight fight there. He was expected to box rings around Thomas Asomba. Then in his last fight, he got dropped as well in the fifth round. He ended up getting up and winning the fight on points, but still, he has not looked his old self. He's had 31 fights. I don't understand what the hell is going on with him. Um, but all the best to him, man. I, I hope he can turn it round and win a world title because he was certainly capable when he turned pro. But 
like I say, he's been a pro now since 2012 and just really hasn't had a, a big fight. It's nearly it's nearly 10 years. Um, elsewhere on that card, let's talk about this one here. Ricky Burns, 43-8 and eight with a draw in a 10-rounder here against Emiliano Dominguez, who's 26-9 and nine with a draw. Never been stopped, Dominguez. Obviously, Ricky Burns never been stopped as well. You'd expect that one's going to go to points. Ricky Burns seems like he hasn't had a fight for ages. Yeah, his last fight was against Lee Selby two years ago. God, wow, oh, wow. Yeah, so um, he should almost be retired, I think, Ricky Burns. But we shall see what happens there. And Lewis, Lewis Ritson, the Sandman, 21-2. and two. He's coming off that, that loss last time out back in June to Jeremiah Ponce. He gets in with Christian Uruzquieta, who has a record of 20-4 and four with two draws. Um, not really a puncher, to be honest with you. Going down the record, his losses have come in... Mm, Decent level, really. Decent level, but I'm not sure. It's going to be interesting. Uh, it is interesting seeing as Ritson's coming off a loss and he hasn't really looked good, let's be honest, since moving up to 140. Definitely not the destroy, destroyer he was down at 135. Moving out now to the Amali Arena in Tampa, Florida, USA. This one's going to be on Showtime pay-per-view. Jake Paul 4-0 in an 8-rounder against Tyrone Woodley. It was supposed to be Tommy Fury. Um, this is a rematch between those guys. I'm just going to say a brief sentence on it, really. Um, obviously, Jake Paul, you know, Hasn't gave Woodley the same notice he had for the first fight. It's not really his fault. I'm I'm kind of giving him applause, uh, applause as well because he has given him the rematch, which didn't look like it was going to happen. He said, you've got to go and get my name tattooed on you. Otherwise, you're not getting the rematch. And he actually went and got his name tattooed on his middle finger, um, Tyrone Woodley. And it didn't look like the fight was going to be happening. And um, it is now happening. Because if I think Jake Paul would have lost to Tommy Fury, surely that's the end of the Jake Paul boxing career. I don't think he's going to fight Tyrone Woodley again. So this is this is brilliant for Woodley that Fury's out of the fight. That's about the only person that is celebrating the fact that Fury's out of the fight. But he hasn't had the time to prepare. But, you know, he's a, he's a fit guy. Um, yeah, I guess it's going to be interesting. I guess it's going to be interesting. But I do want Jake Paul to win because I do eventually want to see that Fury fight. And if he loses, that's the end of it, I think. I don't think he's going to carry on racking up losses. It's not really the same buzz if that were to happen. Um, on the undercard, we also have Jay Leon Love, 24-3 and three with a draw in an eight-rounder against Marcos Oliveira, who's 28-5 and five with a draw. All the best to Jay Leon Love, friend of the show. Uh, we've also got Amanda Serrano, 41-1 and one with one draw in a 10-rounder, of course, 10 two-minute rounds against Miriam Gutierrez. No title on the line, but Miriam Gutierrez, 14-1, and one, lost her O against Katie Taylor, I think it was last year. Uh, Katie Taylor went the distance with her. Can Serrano knock her out? Serrano as well is on the verge of breaking the record for the most knockouts in women's boxing. Um, moving out now to the Armory in Minneapolis. In Minneapolis, Minnesota, USA. Not sure what channel this one's going to be on. I'm guessing Showtime. Um, I'm not sure, to be honest with you. Because you've got Showtime pay-per-view um, with the Jake Paul stuff. I'm not sure if... I think this is going to clash with it. So I don't know what's going on with the TV station. But... You'll have to find that out yourselves, unfortunately. Um, on this card, we've got um, Richardson Hitchens, 12-0. A 10-round contest here. I've heard a lot about this guy, young prospect. He gets in with another young pros prospect, Malik Hawkins, 18-1. and one. Could be a good fight there. But the main event, I've got a lot of interest in this one. We've got David Morrell, the Cuban, 5-0 and with four KOs. He holds a version of the WBA super middleweight world title. And... He gets in with friend of the show, Alontez Slyzer Fox, 28-2 and two with a draw. Obviously, Alontez Fox, two losses came to Liam Williams and Demetrius Andrev. Can Fox pull it off? I really hope he can. All six foot five of him. I want him to work the jab and beat this inexperienced as a pro Cuban. Uh, you know, a guy who's 5-0 and fighting a guy who's had 31 fights. Come on, Alontez Fox. I'd love to see him do it. Very nice guy. And if he does do it... I tell you what, it's going to be unbelievable for him, who, you know, his career is not in a great place at the moment, I don't think. He got smashed by Liam Williams, hasn't really gained any momentum since then. 
Um, moving out now to a fight card that takes place at the H Suite in Birmingham, West Midlands. Over here, just a quick shout out to Hannah Bagley, who hosted a show with me earlier on this year. She said she was going to be a regular part of the panel. Didn't seem like it worked out. Eddie took her place back. <laughs> Hannah Bagley, 1-0. Uh, no opponent just yet for her. Um, and moving out now, this one takes place next Tuesday, actually. Tuesday is taking place down under... Um, Shall I do my Australian accent again for this one, Eddie? I think so, Joe. I think you should. Okay, here yeah, goes man. nothing. Here goes nothing. So this one takes place. This one takes place at the Star Event Centre down in Sydney, South New South Wales. We've got over here Andrew Maloney, former World Title Challenger, twenty-one and two. I'm a bit tired as well, so I don't know if that's the best one, but he's twenty-one and two. He's getting in there with Frolian Saluda, who has a record of thirty-two and four with a draw. This one for the vacant WBO Oriental Super Flyweight title, mate. So all the best there to my good pal Andrew Maloney. That was the best I could do. Um Maloney. Not bad. You like that? You like that? There we go. Yeah, it's not bad. Joe, you got it. <laughs> oh God. Yes. I tell you what, I'll tell you a real quick funny story. Obviously I'm I'm pretty good, I think, with my accent. So I've just did my Australian. Probably not the best you've heard. I do a good Mike Tyson. I think we can agree on that one. And obviously I've done Chris Eubank Senior before many times on the podcast. Um Nigel Ben said to me, I did I did the Chris Eubank one to, to him on the phone, and he said, because he said, like, do it now, let me hear it now. So I gave him a bit of Eubank, Junior, uh, Eubank Senior, and he was like, wow, it was just like him, wow, I can't believe it's made, I've got goosebumps, it was, and I was like, wow, thanks, man, like, I really appreciate it. And then he said to me that a lot of people can do Chris Eubank Senior, but no one can do the Dark Destroyer. Nigel Ben. So I said, all right, okay, give me a little bit of time. I'll work on it. And I sent him a voice note of me doing his voice. And long story short, he didn't reply. I've messaged him a couple of times since, and he has not replied. So I don't know if I've annoyed him with my impression of him, but I tried my best. <laughs> I tried my best. I tried my best. Yo. Um, I don't Yo, think I'm going to release it. <laughs> <laughs> I think... <laughs> I think he was pissed off because it sounded just like him. That's why. He just <laughs> he's like, damn, somebody could do me that well. <laughs> oh, gosh. We shall see. But, no, I don't think I'm going to release it. But that is a true story. And just before we wrap up part two, I do just want to say, get ready for it. Because we will be doing, obviously, this week's podcast going out um, today, which will be the 16th of December. Um, you know, next week's show is the Christmas special, so there will be a long interview with a, you know, with with a former fighter, a former world champion. I think that's going to be on our Christmas special show, and perhaps one or two other surprise guests. We shall see. Haven't really put much work into it just yet. I'm trying my best to get, uh, you know, a kind of strange guest, as I like to do every Christmas. We like to get weird people on. I remember one time we had um, Andrew Selby and Lee Selby and Eric Molina and Charles Martin. They was they was all on the Christmas special. There was another year we had Nonito Donair and Tom Loeffler and I think Hassan and Dam. We like to have really random names and from together. I think it's probably only going to be just one guest. We shall see though, but it's going to be someone from the yesteryear, a former champion. That is my promise to you. And then the week after that, obviously will be the end of the year podcast. It's going to be the final podcast of 2021. And the reason I'm telling you this whole thing is because I need you, the listeners, to send us in your... Um, I've got a list of it right here. We're going to do... Just bear with me. Um, we need your fighter of the year, your young fighter of the year, which they have to be 25 years of age or under. We want your knockout of the year, your upset of the year, your British fighter of the year. When I say that, I don't mean at the very top level. I mean a British fighter who isn't at the top level but has had a fantastic year. There's a few guys not going to give any names away. The most improved fighter, it can be... British and it can be in the world. Um, the prospect of the year, I want to hear that. 
uh, the fight of the year as well, your favourite fight of the year, and also the trainer of the year. And if there's any other categories that spring to mind that you want to throw in, throw them in. Myself and Eddie will analyse each and every one that's sent in, and that is going to be what we pretty much focus on for the end of year podcast. So it's not this week, it's not next week, that's the Christmas special, it's the final podcast of 2021 when we go over those categories. It's going to be fun, I've been looking forward to it all year, and we're going to ask you on Twitter and here to send those in to myself already and they will all be read out it's going to be fun chopping it up because there was going to be a Gennady Golovkin fight that week but that's been cancelled now in Japan against Murata so there's not going to be anything to review so we're going to spend all the time chopping up your uh, you know your picks on those categories but anyway that wraps up part two the final thing for me to do just before we end the show completely is to come in with the outro which I'll do in just a few seconds Okay, and this wraps up episode 322 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A huge thank you to our special guest on this week's podcast, the former middleweight world title challenger, Liam Williams. We did have some minor technical difficulties when recording that Liam Williams interview, so I just want to apologize if anyone was bothered by that. I want to thank you, the listeners, for tuning in once again. I want to thank our sponsor, Manscaped. Remember to visit www.manscaped.com and use the promo code BOXHARD for 20% off plus free shipping. But that's about everything from myself. Enjoy your weekends, people. Stay safe, and we shall see you all again next week.